Thanks for joining us at the Public Library of Anniston, Calhoun County. Make sure to check out the library's summer reading program. You can register at www.publiclibrary.cc slash summer reading. If you are logging into this live stream for summer reading on Read Squared, go to Missions and find the Anniston Museum live stream. Thanks it's for so joining us at the Public Animal Library of Anniston, Calhoun case. County. Make sure to so check hey out guys, the library. So, hey guys, we are from the Anniston Museum program. of Natural History. You can register at www.publiclibrary.cc. Um, and today we have a special program, and of course we brought some animals. If you are logging that. into um, my name is Cheyenne. I am the collections assistant. I take care of the artifacts and the archives. And I'm Dawn, the educational interpreter, so I take care of all the animals. Thanks for joining us at the Public Library of Anniston Educational County. Make sure to check out the library. So, hey guys, we are from the Anniston Museum of Natural History. You can register at www.publiclibrary.cc. And today we have a special program. Of course, we brought some animals. If you are allowed to give us just my name is Cheyenne, and then we'll tell you a little bit about about them. I take care of the artifacts, go to missions, and find I'm Dawn, the educational interpreter, so I take care of all the animals at the Animal Library of Anniston Educational County. Make sure to check out the library. Hey guys, so we are from the Anniston Museum of Natural History. Make sure to register at www.publiclibrary.com. And today we have a special program. Okay, critter number one is out. Okay, you want to tell them about him while I <laughs> Right, so while Cheyenne struggles over here with our other one, this right here is our red-footed tortoise, and his name is Red. So, Cheyenne, what is our first fable that we are talking about? Oh my gosh, I would love to tell you that. <laughs> so, we're talking about the tortoise and the hare, so I guess you guys can probably guess that. Cheyenne is currently trying to pull out our rabbit. Um, she's not very happy right okay. now with us. Um, and there she is. <laughs> so this is Hazel. Um, she is a European rabbit. Actually, I should probably hold him so you guys can see him. So uh. rabbits and hares are a little bit different. So the myth is called the myth of the tortoise and the hare. Okay, now like Dawn said, this is a rabbit. So there are a few differences. Number one, their size. So I know that Hazel here looks really big, um, but you have to keep in mind that this is a pet rabbit. Um, so she has been bred to be bigger. Whereas in the wild, let's think about the ones that are around here. Okay, so we have our little cottontails, right? They're the little brown bunnies. They have the cute little tails. You see them sometimes often around dusk or nighttime. Um, and they're much smaller. Now a hare is going to be big in the wild. Um, they do not make good pets. They do not domesticate well. Um, so a rabbit is something you can take out of the wild and within a few generations, you're gonna have um, a domesticated breed. Whereas with hares, they're never gonna domesticate. Okay, so they're gonna be huge. Their diets are different. She's gonna love those plants that have a lot of water in them. Um, that's where she gets a lot of her water from. She's gonna love fruits, whereas hares, um, live in kind of drier areas, and so they're going to re, uh, rely on, you know, drier plants that we don't really have around here. Right. So our hares tend to live in way more extreme conditions, so they're going to live in our tundras, like way up in like Canada, or our deserts way down in like Texas and Mexico. So they're little <laughs> dudes. Um, so this is our tortoise. So Cheyenne, do you think this guy can swim? Um, I don't know. He doesn't look like he can swim very well. Right. He's very heavy. I'm struggling a little bit. <laughs> don't have very good upper arm strength, guys. Um, so he basically looks like a big rock, um, which means that he is not super aerodynamic in the water. Um, he cannot swim very well. Let me say that. So when we're talking about tortoises and turtles, um, every tortoise is a turtle, but not every turtle is a tortoise. <laughs> so I know that sounds a little confusing. Our tortoises are just our turtles that live in more arid conditions. They, they have a little bit more um, ability to withstand drier conditions, just like our hares versus our rabbits. But in Aesop's fable, like we said, um, our tortoise and our hare, our tortoise is slow and steady and wins the race, and our rabbit is supposed to be all kinds of fast, but she gets lazy. And that part of the myth, I would say, is pretty true. It is. <laughs> so in the myth, you know, the turtle, or the tortoise and the hare, um, get into a race, and of course everyone thinks the rabbit's going to win. Why? Because if you look at Hazel here, she's kind of built for running. She has these very strong back legs, and especially hares have really strong back legs. So they can get up and they can go really fast, but the problem is, in the story, the bunny is so content in how fast it knows that it is, that it goes to sleep. 
also it says I have so much time because this tortoise is moving so slow. I mean, you see Red, he hasn't even moved these little legs hardly. <laughs> so he says, you know, I'll just take a nap and it'll be fine. I can go to sleep and then I'll still win this race. But unfortunately, like Dawn said, the tortoise is slow, but he's steady. He never gives up and he makes it to the finish line before the hare can. And on another note, everybody says these guys are slow. Now, I'm not going to say they're cheetah fast because they are not necessarily a fast animal. But man, they can pick up and go if they really want to. This guy takes off and does laps around our live animal building regularly. He's probably our most active, um, and he just takes off. If he wants to go, he will. So. And what does he get up and go for the... Man, he <laughs> loves food. <laughs> <laughs> he loves food. So the second you put his food down, he's getting up and he's going for yes, it. Yes, he specifically, his name is Red, like we said. So he is a red-footed tortoise. Um, and it, But it also fits in the fact that he absolutely loves red-colored food. Um, yes. Strawberries tomatoes, um, red nail polish on your toes. Yes, there's he a reason. they're berries. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so, you know, that's, that's a normal thing. But that's also because of where they live. So they are native to South America. They, they live at the base of the Andes Mountains. And all the fruit down there that they would enjoy is, is brightly colored because it is tropical. So you think of, like, what what would you think of when you think of like a tropical fruit right like so a so, mango maybe yeah we think of like mangoes we think of pineapples things that have to be in very warm very moist environments to grow right so bright colors they tend to like that so so that is our tortoise and our hair <laughs> again we only have a tortoise and she's not quite a hair but she still played the role very well so yes. this was miss hazel and mr red so now we'll put them up and we'll move on to our next animal we will. Dealing with live animals is a struggle. You have to kind of work with them, guys. So uh, we apologize for any delays. Yes, a lot of times we have to work on their schedule. So they definitely <laughs> run the show around here. Now this next one always gets a lot of oohs and ahs out of the crowd. Okay, they are typically a sign of wisdom. Do you guys have any idea what I might be getting ready to pull out? Some of you guys may have seen this animal as well. He does a lot of programs for us, and he sits outside at the museum. So you can actually go to the museum and see him anytime you want, unless we are using him for a program. So he's not very graceful. Um, so it's going to take Cheyenne another minute to get him out. Okay, right. let's make sure. Woo, he's going to spread his wings out for you guys. <laughs> so if you haven't guessed yet, this guy right here is an owl. Specifically, he is a barred owl, B-A-R-R-E-D. So if you look, if you can see his chest right here, he has these feathers that kind of look like bars going down his chest. Okay, typically um, animal names are not trying to fool you. So you think of a barred owl, it's because he has bars. You think of a barn owl and they live in barns. Okay, so his bars are not necessarily because he's going to jail, even though sometimes we would like to put him there because he doesn't <laughs> always behave. Um, but they are actually for what we call camouflage. So camouflage is how an animal will blend in with his surroundings. So if you look at him, his front, like his bars, and even his back where he has all this brown and white striping, it matches our like woods. Um, it matches all the deciduous forest, which are trees that um, lose their leaves in the fall and winter. Um, it, he just blends in very, very well so that Predators, things that are going to eat him, like bigger birds, can't find him. And then also so his prey cannot see him. So. so, like she said, he's blended in very well. So if you look at his back, it looks almost like the light filtering down through um, some branches or something. So owls are hunters, okay? They're called a bird of prey. So this means that they are birds that eat prey items. So typically we think of a bird and we think, oh, they may go off and eat a worm or they may eat some seeds on the ground. Not this guy. He's a little bit too big for a worm to fill up. Um, mm -hmm. And he does have a very big appetite. Yes, he does. So what he does is uses his talons. So that's why I'm wearing this glove here. It may be kind of hard to see, but he has these very sharp claws. Um, and he has this hooked beak right here um, that he uses whenever he captures his food. So he's gonna swoop down. Owls a lot of times have what's called silent flight. So they have special feathers 
that help them stay quiet when they're flying through the air. Because when you think of something like a mouse or a rat, they have really big ears, right? So they can hear stuff. So he wants to be super quiet when he's coming down to get them. And then he's going to grab them in his talons and take it back to his nest. He doesn't want to eat on the ground because, like Dawn said, things bigger than him want to eat him. Um, he'll take it back to the nest, and he uses this beak essentially like a fork and a knife, okay? So he can't really use those. Um, he's not very polite at the dinner table, so he's just going to try to eat as much of his food whole as he can. Um, and because he eats so much of that, he's going to eat everything, the fur, the bones, whatever's in there, but he can't really digest that stuff. So what he does is kind of gross. They actually spit back up what's called a pellet, and that contains everything that they can't really digest. Yeah. So owls, on top of their incredibly sharp talons and mouth, they have a few other tools to help them hunt. So we all kind of know about owls. They can like spin their head all the way around, right? So that's not quite true. Um, they actually can only go about, what, not quite 360, but they yeah. can see all the way behind them. And they have to turn their head all the way back around and look back the other way. So that's because they actually have really, really good vision. So these guys can see a mouse from, what, across a football field, I think. Um, and their eyes are really, really specialized. Um, but with that comes the fact that they actually cannot move their eyeball. So that's why they have to move their heads like that. Um, but they also have pretty good hearing. And their hearing is actually specialized because their ears are not like our ears. So our ears are what's called symmetrical, right? So they're on the same side of our face, in the same position. They match each other if you were to fold them and fold our face in half, right? These guys aren't like that. So they have one ear right up here by their eye, and I think it's actually on this side. And then their other ear is farther back in their head, and that actually helps them tell um, like distance or depth, mm -hmm. I guess. Um, and that's really interesting. Um, but why do we have this owl here? Um, what kind of legends do we have to tell about this owl, Cheyenne? So, if you think about the owl, like I said earlier, a lot of people associate this animal with wisdom, okay? And that's because if you look at him, you know, he's kind of very stoic. That means he's not showing any kind of emotion. He's just sitting here. So, anytime you see an owl at night or around dusk, they tend to be just sitting in a tree, and they appear to just be sitting there thinking. What they're really doing is waiting for a mouse or something to come <laughs> running along. Um, but people who don't know that may look at this animal and say, wow, that animal just seems so wise. He seems like he has life really figured out. Mm -hmm. Now, another reason these guys are associated with wisdom is because the goddess Athena in Greek mythology mm -hmm. oftentimes um, was depicted with an owl. And so she was the goddess of wisdom and battle strategy. Mm -hmm. And so owls became associated with wisdom through her as well. Now, those are kind of, kind of some positive things, um, but here in America, Native Americans have their own myths about owls, and that is that owls were actually um, kind of the messenger between the worlds. They could see between the worlds, um, and oftentimes they would warn people um, of like an upcoming death or something. Mm -hmm. So if you heard an owl call um, maybe three nights in a row, it kind of differs, then that meant that death was coming. Um, but, of course, we know that these guys are not here um, to be boogeymen. They're actually here to help us control our rodent populations. Right. So that's actually why we have some protections on our birds is people saw them, like we said, as death omens, right? So they saw them as being kind of evil creatures. Um, so they started to take them out of the ecosystem, right? Um, but this issue came up where, okay, we take our owls and our hawks and things like that away. Well then they're not controlling our rodent population, so guess what? Rodents come and get our food because, you know, we like grains, we like rice, we like all that stuff. Well, so do the rodents. So they're going to come in, they're going to eat all our food, they're going to leave poop behind, right? Um, and we can get infections from that, and it makes you really, really sick. So that is why we need to protect our birds, and that's why they're federally protected anyways, mm -hmm. um, because we don't want them to come out of our ecosystem. Yes, and that is actually why Mel is with us. So you may be wondering, well, if these birds are federally protected, um, then how do you have one on your hand right now? <laughs> and that is, if you look um, at Mel's eye over here, you may have noticed, if he'll turn towards the camera more, there he goes. So he's actually only got one eye. Um, so Dawn mentioned they have super good eyesight, but they can't turn their heads. Um, so they don't have periphery, which is where you can see things out of the corner of your eyes. So what happens a lot of times is these guys will see a prey item across the road, 
um, at night, and they go and they get so focused on flying towards that prey item that they don't notice or they can't turn their head to see the car that's coming for them. Um, and so what happened to Mel is he actually got hit by a car, um, and thankfully his wings are okay, he's perfectly okay, but he did lose that eye. Um, so all of the birds at the Anderson Museum, you can come out and you can see on our Bird of Prey trail, um, and you may notice, you know, there's some weird stuff about these birds. <laughs> um, so we have, like, Mel with one eye. Some of our birds have what's called a dropped wing, so their wings look a little crooked. Um, and that's because all of these birds have been in accidents, and they were not able to be released back into the wild. Right, so they come and live with us, and they educate people, and they help you guys to learn more about owls, so you don't have to go out into the wild and seek them out, right? So um, yes. he's doing his kind of a service mm -hmm. um, in a way. He may not enjoy it all the time, but everybody else does. Yes. So, so this is Mel. Um, if you didn't get enough of him, like I said, you can come out to the Anderson Museum anytime. Um, our gates are open. You're welcome to walk the nature trails. And you can come and you can visit Mel, who's always sitting there waiting for visitors to come mm -hmm. by him. So now we're going to move on to our last critter. So this critter, some of you may not be as good with this stuff, but you're a little bit fancy. We definitely are. These are some of our favorites. And I'm sure So this is our friend Babette, and Babette is what's called a ball python. Um, so these guys are native to Africa, um, and they like really hot temperatures. They like to come out at night, so that means that they are nocturnal. Um, and she'll just wrap up on my arm like this, which is kind of why they're called ball pythons. They just kind of sit there in little balls, <laughs> right? Yes. So these guys you may have seen before in America um, just because they're super popular in the pet trade. And that is because they are so docile or nice. Um, so snakes only have one way of telling you they want to be left alone, which is to bite. Yeah. <laughs> so a lot of people are scared of snakes because they say, oh my gosh, this thing could bite me. Um, but at the museum, we love to say anything with a mouth can bite. Um, so it's not just snakes, and this girl right here is a perfect example of a snake with a very good temperament. She's been around people all of her life, mm -hmm. so she's very friendly. Um, but even in the wild, they don't really go out of their way to be aggressive towards people, um, especially where they're from in Africa. So they're actually seen as signs of royalty where they're from in Africa. Right. So kings and queens out in Africa will walk around, and when they find these guys, um, if they don't take them back, to um, a less populated area, they will actually take them and wear them as like jewelry. So the way that I'm wearing her right now, she'll sit like this forever. She does not care. She's just gonna chill. So they used to do that. They used to take them and put them on their wrists. They would put them on their heads, around their necks, and make like necklaces and crowns mm -hmm. and bracelets and things because they're so beautiful. They're gorgeous snakes and they just sit here and they're fairly docile like Cheyenne said. So um, that is why in places that aren't America, they call them royal pythons, actually, instead of ball pythons. We just have to be a little bit weird. We do. Um, <laughs> also, there are there is a legend that I read about when I was doing some research about these ball pythons. And one specific kind of area in Africa actually sees these guys as a protector. So they the legend goes that this these members of this tribe were trying to escape someone who was trying to hurt them, right? So they're running and they're running and they hit a river. And they can't cross this river, it's too dangerous. Well, this ball python comes out and goes, hey, what's going on? So they tell him what's going on and he goes, oh, well, let me help you. So he turns into a big log and it becomes like a canoe kind of a thing and he helps him get across the river. So his only request was to respect his, his species afterwards. So now that tribe takes these guys very seriously and treats them with a lot of respect, as we all should with snakes. Yes. So. so snakes, like I said, are one of those things. People tend to either love them or hate them, but just like Mel, um, they help us out with our rodent population. There are actually a lot of different cultures in Africa that have long held beliefs um, that snakes are actually very good for us. Um, mm -hmm. In ancient Egypt, there were several snake deities. 
Um, just a couple of them. One of them was called the Uraeus. He wasn't so much a deity. If you ever look at a pharaoh's crown, you see that snake reared in the striking position. That was actually to protect the pharaoh. So it was believed that anybody walking up to the pharaoh with ill intent um, would actually have this cobra spit into their eye. Um, and then there was another god called Neheb Ka who had two heads, um, and he was a snake, and he guarded the underworld. So mm -hmm. um, he had those two heads so that he could constantly see all the way around him. Of course, what's ironic is that now we know snakes don't have very good eyesight. Mm -hmm. So how does Babette see? So Babette has a couple different ways that she sees. She's a little bit special, right? So now all snakes, like she said, have bad eyesight. So all snakes use their tongues to quote unquote see or smell, as a lot of people like to say. So they'll take their tongues, which are forked, right? So they have that traditional like forked look, um, and they just kind of stick them out and pull them back in repeatedly. And that's kind of how they, they feel their way around and they figure out what's going on. So those forks actually also tell them what side the scent is coming from, right? So say I was to stick my tongue out right now and I smell Cheyenne. Well, my tongue is not forked, so I'll be like, well, where's Cheyenne? I don't know. She's somewhere near me, though, right? But if Babette's sticking her tongue out, she smells me and Cheyenne, and she goes, oh, okay, well, they're on this side of me while, you know, another person or the animals or whatever are in front of her. So she actually can be have, have spatial awareness, mm -hmm. right? Um, so she can understand what's around her very easily with her tongue. But like I said, Babette's actually pretty special. So Babette also has what we call heat pits. So most of our native snakes don't have heat pits, but some of our venomous snakes do, and they are called our pit vipers. So what a heat pit does, we don't fully understand the way that they kind of interpret that information in their brains, but we kind of also understand what it, what it kind of does. So mm -hmm. they can uh, feel the heat, not quite the way we do, but from like more of an in infrared, I guess, yeah. way, right? So they can kind of see the heat coming off. So if I was to look at Cheyenne, obviously, like I know she's alive, I know she's warm, <laughs> but I can't see the heat radiating off of her, whereas Babette can. Um, and she can understand that Cheyenne is this, but the microphone is, is cold, right? So um, it's very interesting. Now, she has a bunch going along her lip. She's got probably about eight. Now, we have some pit vipers, so our rattlesnakes, our copperheads, and our cottonmouths are all pit vipers. So they have this same ability to sense this heat with this little pit, and theirs is, they have one, and it's between their eye and their nose. Um, and they, again, they do the same thing, right? So they can understand where the, oh, excuse me, where the heat is coming from. Now, I do not suggest you get in to a rattlesnake's face. No. Look at this. Um, if you're interested, though, uh, we do have two pit vipers on display at the Madison Museum of Natural History. Um, and our rattlesnake is named Grumpy, and you can get a real close look at him, or our copperhead named Copper. And he also has the pit. He's just a little bit smaller, so it's a little bit harder to see on him. Mm -hmm. But what else you got to say? <laughs> So that's pretty much all we have um, as far as our animals. We were curious if you had any questions. How big is Python? That depends on what kind of python you're talking about. So she, if you're looking at a ball python, this is actually a fairly large one. Um, this is yeah. about as big as they'll get. She's very chunky. Um, she is. <laughs> she's quite chunky. Um, but you know, they'll, they'll get a little bit smaller than this. Now, if you're talking about our Burmese python, who right now is about nine feet long, but he is not the biggest they can get. So our Burmese, Burmese pythons, the females, can get over 20 feet long, which is crazy. It's and they snake. get about <laughs> this big around. Yes, yeah, so they're, they they're are very large <laughs> snakes. Um, um, pythons come from pretty much all over the world. Mm -hmm. Um, so they vary a lot by what region they're in. Right. So if you think about something like Babette, she lives in Africa in kind of an arid region. region. Mm -hmm. She doesn't have many super big predators that are going to come after her. Mm -hmm. But let's, you know, move on to Southeast Asia, where um, our Burmese pythons are from. Yeah. And like tigers. You have tigers. You have all these cops. huge things that can come and get the snake. And so they're going to get huge so that not only can they maybe fight this thing off, but if you see a snake that big, um, if you're something that wants to eat it, you're going to say, mm, maybe not. Yeah. <laughs> That's actually a really good question. Um, what else you got for us? No. So um, 
Our tortoises actually need a wide variety of their diet, so they eat everything from greens, vegetables, fruits. Some will eat insects and things like that. They don't typically go for the, the like meat or animals or anything like that. But you know, our turtles, turtles are omnivorous, so that means they're like us and they do eat both vegetables and fish or mice or things like that. Um, just they, they all have a very wide variety of diet, and it also just depends on, you know, what animal it is, just like we said with our pythons, mm -hmm. um, and where they're from. So, great question, too. No more questions? Right. Ooh, okay. Well, if any of you guys watching at home have any questions, please feel free to comment on our Facebook page, and someone from our museum will get back to you as soon as we can. Or you guys can just take a visit to the museum, and we'll be there, and you can ask us all the questions that your heart desires. So thank you guys for having us today. Sure. Yeah. All right. So the whole thing. Okay. So um, make sure to check out the library summer reading program. You can register at www.publiclibrary.cc/summerreading. And if you are logging into this on the live stream for the summer reading program on Read Squared, um, go to the missions and find the Aniston Museum live stream. And the code word is animals, and it's all lowercase. Thank you, guys. <laughs>